What evil awakens me in the night? There are many famous battles of this war. From the rude awakening at Bull Run to the emancipating fields of Antietam or the watershed events in Gettysburg. These engagements won their renown for the tens if not hundreds of thousands of brave men deciding the future of this nation. While each gruesome in their own right, they are organized chaos. Under the distinguished direction of generals like Robert E. Lee or George G. Meade. Today isn't such an event. Today is Fort Pillow. It isn't known for its importance in the war for the brilliant display of military prowess. Fort Pillow isn't known for its struggle, but for its slaughter. This fortress is the site of a national bloodletting, a butchering, a massacre. Fortification Pillow is named after Rebel General Gideon J. Pillow, initially constructed to secure secessionist dominance of the Mississippi River. It fell early in the war, and has since been a defense of the Union supply line. The breastworks are supposed to be defended by over 10,000 infantry and artillerymen, but it's only manned by 600 or so. General William T. Sherman had requested the fort evacuated so the men there could join with him. This was done, but his cavalry commander, Officer William Soy Smith, had later ordered Major Bradford to, under the authority of General Stephen Hicks, reoccupy Pillow as a base of recruitment. When news came in, the devil Nathan Bedford Forrest was raiding the area, Major Lionel F. Booth, an experienced heavy gun commander, was sent with the 6th U.S. Colored Heavy Artillery Regiment and Battery D, 2nd United States Light Artillery Regiment, colored, to protect Bradford. Folklore in the Memphis area claims that the men of Booth and Bradford pillaged the area, stealing food, horses, and valuables. Later accusations of assault, murder, and rape are levied, as these charges will later be used to attempt to justify later actions, let's examine them. First, even the most heinous of these allegations were true, that obviously does not condemn an entire group to execution, nor should justice be given without trial by vigilante soldiers. Now for the indictments of theft, these are most definitely true. General Smith had ordered Bradford subsist upon the country as far as possible and take the stock necessary to keep it well mounted. Subsist upon the country as far as possible. Take the stock necessary to keep it well mounted. In a war where hundreds of thousands die, how can brutality stand out? Using civilian stock to feed and equip a unit has been used by both sides of the war. The difference is, Smith continues to tell Bradford to only pay those loyal to the Union. This is also not uncommon, but highly questionable. As for the seizures of valuables, that is illegal. But frequently happens as the poorly paid privates see an opportunity to make a quick buck. As for the more violent crimes, these often go unreported. But there is no evidence of them, and that accusations only come in after the battle. Forrest himself in his memoirs goes short of accusing his opponents of murder or rape only insulting women, which while bad-mannered is constitutional and in my opinion not worthy of any punishment. Furthermore, all these could have only been committed by Bradford's white cavalry regiment as the colored artillerymen never left base, only arriving in late March and being put to work every waking moment, digging in, preparing cannons, and drilling. Booth is an attentive leader, he kept good note of what his men were doing at every second of the day. Forrest did not write to Fort Pillow to bring justice to murderers. His most noble cause was to end the insults levied at the female sex. There is a federal force of 500 or 600 at Fort Pillow, which I shall attend to in a day or two. They have horses and supplies which we need. There is a federal force of 500 or 600 at Fort Pillow, which I shall attend to in a day or two. They have horses and supplies which we need. The most important reason was to capture the fort, to turn the gun of the northerners on their shipping, hoping to destabilize Union logistics. If captured, it could also be used to resupply the rebel raiders. How can a man like him exist? His plan is terror. That her earlier threatened war crimes on his failed assault at Paducah, for which northern newspapers ridiculed him for not only losing the battle, but also missing horses he was hoping to acquire. In a petty move to disprove the papers, and also to distract from his true intentions, at Pillow, he orders a subordinate to return to Paducah. Forrest has 1,500 to 2,500 men. They can take on 600 poorly trained bluecoats, 
but only as long as they aren't reinforced. Using traitorous guides, who were supposedly detained by Bradford, Forrest is led to the fortress. While well, butchers and villains cannot call the evil cavalry corps incompetent. Troopers from my home state of Missouri quickly surprise and capture pickets. Only lucky few make it back to warn Booth and Bradford. Virginal Chalmers leads the main rebel cavalry division. Colonel McCullough has started the battle with his brigade. These men are veterans with well-used weapons, an imposing sight for our green boys. At lightning speed, the entire fort is laid to siege and surrounded. The alarm is sounded and Major Booth takes over full command. Tennessee Royal Cavalry is deployed to rifle pits. 20 men clutch to their guns when musket bolts fly overhead. The duel begins, both sides expertly using cover, but the veteran Confederates gain the upper hand. The colored cannoneers roll their guns into their batteries and open fire on the advancing rebels. The nearby USS New Era is signaled for help, but events are moving so quickly that it's a wonder if they'll arrive in time. By now, Force is pressing Booth from all sides. His advanced riflemen are overrun. The impressive and once thought impregnable breastworks are taken. Rebel flag is placed defiantly on them. We are forced back to the main redoubt. Southern sharpshooters take their time decimating Federal command as lieutenants fall down dead. Horsemen open fire with pistols and carbines. Smoke clings to the earth. Panic takes hold of the Union. Hoping to calm the situation, Major Booth walks calmly, rallying his artillerymen, giving orders directly. But exposing himself to the battle was a mistake as rebel marksmen take steady aim and strikes officer's heart with a well-placed shot. The exemplar of courage and experience is killed instantly. His adjunct is likewise struck down. Major Bradford, then experienced, is now the leader. The situation is terrible. Rebels have locked him in and are picking off his men. Forrest has arrived on site. The rebels are eager, and some of his artillery ammunition is defective. I do not envy Bradford's state, but he still has the tall walls. And as seen at Paducah, Nathan has trouble with fortifications. Joe McCullough asks for permission to silence the federal guns, and is told, Go ahead and take them. The southern flank is silenced, as Bradford is forced to fall back. But his men do not falter. The black troops know that if captured, their future is dark. With blood running from their bodies, still engaged, loading and firing cannon and muskets cheerfully. This report comes from a civilian who took up arms to defend Pillow. The rank and file are confident they can hold the walls. Force is confident he can take them if need be. But he doesn't wish to lose men when avoidable. Plus, Major Booth is an honorable man who cares about his men. So, if threatened with massacre, he might accept the more peaceful imprisonment. To Major Booth, commanding United States Forces, Fort Pillow. Major, the conduct of the officers of men in Fort Pillow has been such as to entitle them to be treated as prisoners of war. I demand the unconditional surrender of this garrison, promising that you shall be treated as prisoners of war. My men have received a fresh supply of ammunition, and their present position can easily assault and capture the fort. Should my demand be refused, I cannot be responsible for the fate of your command. Respectfully, M.B. Forrest, Major General, commanding. A truce party is had. Does this include the Negro soldiers as well as the whites? Yes, if the fort surrenders, the entire garrison, white and Negroes, will be treated as prisoners of war. Bradford responds. General, yours of this instance is received, and in reply, I have to ask one hour for consultation and consideration with my officers, the officers of the gunboat. In the meantime, no preparations are to be made on either side. Very respectfully, your obedient servant, L.F. Booth, Major, commanding U.S. Forces. Booth has been dead for hours, but Bradford believes he has a better shot in negotiating as Booth than himself. The no preparations clause is broken as Force moves to blockade the fort from sea, and he gives only 20 minutes, not the requested hour. During these minutes, some claim that drunk black soldiers insulted Forrest's men, daring them to attack. Since it's unlikely that whiskey was being served during the battle, I don't believe these charges. Negotiations will not obtain the desired object. Forrest is irate from this reply, especially when he overhears some talk from two Union officers. I doubt Forrest is even here. It's a trick. They're just using his name as a trick to fool us. I am General Forrest. Go back and say to Major Booth that I demand an answer in plain, unmistakable English. Will he fight or surrender? Bradford has his council of war. The Rebs kill white officers commanding cowards, don't they? They'll likely shoot or hang us right here. We might as well fight. 
From what I've heard, any coach are sent back to their masters or killed. Forrest hates Negroes. He used to be a slave trader, known to whip his slaves to death. But the note says we'll be treated as prisoners of war and says nothing different about coloreds. Don't the rebs have to treat us decent if they let us surrender? Likely we'd stand a better chance surrendering. If we don't, they'll kill us for sure. Surrender. With the major bodies lying cold by the river, he'd never surrender to those damn success traitors. Besides, I still think it's a trick. We don't even know if Forrest is really here. We can hold out against anything. I'm no Isaac Hawkins, and we're not surrendering to those damn secesh. Forrest gets a short reply. I will not surrender. It is improper for a man to be at leisure when describing these falling events. The rebel bugle sounded, and in five minutes, rebels had captured the fort. Though quick and unwavering movement, they had surprised our men and ended all resistance. The battle is over. The death should stop. Should. What happens next is debated. This isn't to say it's up to debate. The evidence clearly lands on one side. But for the sake of balance, let us first hear from the rebel account. The man was made for the surrender, which was refused. The victory was complete, and the loss of the enemy will never be known from the fact that a large number ran into the river and were shot and drowned. The force was exposed about 500 Negroes and 200 white soldiers, Tennessee Tories. The river was dyed with the blood of the sword for 200 yards. There was in the fort a large number of citizens who had fled there to escape the conscript law. Most of these ran into the river and were drowned. The approximate loss was upward of 500 killed, but few of the officers escaped. It's so that these facts will demonstrate to the northern people that Negro soldiers cannot cope with southerners. It is hoped that these facts will demonstrate to the northern people that Negro soldiers cannot cope with southerners. So strong in their belief that black soldiers aren't their equal. But yet, so cowardly they can't admit what they did. Others claim that the Union soldiers didn't even surrender. And while running to the river, the Federals continued to open fire on them. Or that the Bluecoats were drunk and belligerent and tried to take up their weapons again. Wait, isn't that the accusation regarding General Mountain's death at Mansfield? <laughs> Many of these accounts give credit to Forrest for ending the battle, either by ordering the cessation of fire or cutting down the American flag to signal the loss of Bradford. It was decidedly the most horrible sight that I have ever witnessed. They refused to surrender which incised our man, and if General Forrest had not run between our men and the Yanks with his pistol and saber drawn, not a man would have been spared. It took about 125 white men and about 45 Negroes. Most of the 800 are numbered with the dead. General Forrest begged them to surrender, but not the first sign of surrender was ever given. Yet some among the rebel ranks were more truthful. From a newspaper correspondent, For ten minutes death reigned in the fortification, along the riverbank. Our troops, maddened by the excitement, shot down the retreating Yankees. Not till they had attained the water's edge and turned to beg for mercy, did any prisoners fall into our hands. Thus, the watch received quarter. But the Negroes were shown no mercy. Our men were so exasperated by the Yankees' threats of no quarter that they gave but little. The slaughter was awful. Words cannot describe the scene. The poor deluded Negroes would run up to our men, fall on their knees, and with uplifted hands scream for mercy. But they were ordered to their feet and then shot dead. The white men fared but little better. The fort turned out to be a great slaughter pen. Blood, human blood, stood about in pools, and brains could have been gathered up in any quantity. I, with other, I, with several others, tried to stop the butchery. That one time had partially succeeded, but General Forrest ordered them shot down like dogs. The carnage continued. Finally, our men became sick of blood, and the firing ceased. Now for the Union side, which the consensus concludes is correct. One rebel nurse that I was alive shot at me again and missed me. Just at that time, I saw them shoot down three black men who were begging for their lives and who had surrendered. The rebels had commenced an indiscriminate slaughter of the black soldiers. Saw four white men and at least 25 Negroes shot while begging for mercy, including a Negro dragged from a hollow log just 10 feet away. As one rebel held him by the foot, another shot him. Two women shot by the river bank, their bodies thrown into the river, shot after he had surrendered. Do you belong to a regiment? Yes, I do. How did you come to command a regiment? I was detailed here. 
Oh, we'll give you a detail. And it was ordered with several others to march up the hill, and we were fired upon while thus marching. They also shot Sergeant Guantley, my company, while he was within 10 feet of me. After he had given up his revolver, while he had his hands up, they took his own revolver and shot him through with its contents twice through the head, killing him instantly. Private May saw the massacre of two black women and three of their kids. Yes, goddamn you, you thought you were free, did you? And shot them all. They all fell but one child when he knocked it in the head with the breech of his gun. Forrest had ordered Commander Bradford's death personally. His body was literally shot to pieces. And I saw 17 men thus shot, not knowing their names, after first being taken prisoners. I've grown too accustomed to death. This war has made us all monsters. The massacre ends eventually, and when the smoke clears, the true terror can be counted. 14 rebels killed, 86 wounded. For the Federals, 350 murdered, 60 wounded, 164 captured, 574 total. This is the reason I call for Satan. This is the darkest moment of the war. What kind of God can allow this to happen? What kind of man can live with himself after doing this? Kill the last damn one of them. I'd like to thank you. I'd like to thank you all for watching this video. I'm not going to do the normal self-publicity. Fort Pillow is something I knew was always going to happen. And while I know I couldn't, I hope I got even close to giving it the due respect I deserve. I hope all of you can understand this event not merely as a historical one, but as a personal one. One that, while distant in time, is so close in heart and spirit. I often am jovial. And quite enjoy doing this report. And I was not saddened by restating the facts as I understood them. I'm not saddened to be reporting. I am saddened that this happened. I hope we all can learn from this event and be respectful and intuitive to those who lost their lives needlessly at Fort Pillow. I hope we can all learn to be better so that in uh, many generations from now, no one else will have to report on such an event again.